Welcome to this fourth week of the Smart Grid Technologies course. Change of speaker today and also change of TA. So I would like to introduce the two main TAs in the back, Shonak, who's also our Zoom master. This course will be recorded and posted online. And Ludovic, who will be helping with the TA, with the uh, software assignments. So this week and the coming two other weeks, so during three weeks, we will be organized as follows. We'll teach on uh, the regular slot today and towards the last uh, 30 minutes of today, uh, you can have time to take the quiz. So the lecture is accompanied with a quiz uh, online and uh, the lab, uh, which is posted already, uh, you can already start it. So about the quizzes, the rules are the one you, you know. Uh, you are expected to take the quiz uh, with a passing grade, although the grade does not count for the final grade of the course. And you're allowed to take up three attempts. After the third attempt, if you don't pass, you have a problem. You have a deadlock and you have to speak to me to uh, resolve the deadlock. And speaking to me might involve giving you an oral quiz to make sure uh, you really master the, the stuff. Well, hopefully that happens to nobody. The quizzes are chain. You must be up to date. You must have done this week's quiz to be able to upload the lab. And next week you will also need to be up to date with this week's quiz to do the following quiz, etc. The idea of this is to force you to do online training by small pieces. Uh, rather than uh, having to digest big things altogether, which is probably not doable. What is the objective of this part? This part is a bit atypical in a smart grid course. Smart grid is the, essentially an electrical uh, engineering topic where you will speak of uh, phasers, PMUs, signal processing, etc. We'll speak of uh, optimal power flow in a few more weeks. Uh, but all of this is connected through a network. So we somehow have to put our things and our fingers into the communication part. And the minimum part is what we will cover in this, talk, in this uh, series of lectures. So the goal is to be able to have a mental image of the main ideas that underlie TCP IP so that you can use it well. Of course, you will not be an expert in communication systems and in TCP IP after taking this module but you will know already much more than most people, uh, including most engineers, and you will be able to go on the internet if you need to, to know more. So what is more difficult in TCP IP is to have the correct ideas about how the architecture is organized. This is what we will follow, we will uh, um, discover today and, in, uh, and next week. Of course, there are zillions of details that we will not follow uh, in detail in this course. For example, if you buy a router of a specific uh, for ABB, for example, to interconnect your PMU devices. Uh, you will need to read the manual of uh, how to uh, make it work. But in order to read the manual, uh, you will it will be much easier for you to read it and understand because you will understand what are the basic uh, things that it is speaking about. Uh, there are two uh, books that I recommend. Uh, they are not necessary. You can take this course by simply having the slides. You can also look up on the internet where the Wikipedia pages on any topic are usually fairly good for the topics uh, we cover here. And if you want to know more, there are those two books that are available online. This one is not officially available online, the last edition, but in practice it is. And uh, this one is an open book, so you can really find it uh, online here. This one is more superficial. It's, it gives the main ideas, but some of the details are not necessarily uh, well covered here. It goes a bit deeper. So let's start. Let's start first with a, a global view, which is called the layer model. And then we will go one by one into some of the main, I will zoom on some of the main topics. You may have heard the layered model of communication systems. It's a system with some order in the layers. And the course will not necessarily follow the layers because by experience, this is not what is the most useful uh, way of learning things. So computer communication is about letting things communicate things, I mean objects, or people communicate over the network. And of course, we all know how to do it and how to use it. 
essentially, it's organized in what is called client-server communication. So you have clients, which are typically small, but not always small objects or smartphones or the PMUs that communicates with servers that are, for example, uh, the websites uh, or the PDCs when the PMU send data to a PDC here. Why do we have this terminology client server? Well, this is solving a bootstrap problem of communication. If I want to speak to you, we have to agree on the place where we are together. So we somehow through the mechanism of EPFL agreed to be here at the same time this morning so we can speak together. Uh, if you want two machines to speak together, you have the same problem. They need somehow to, to be ready for speaking. You cannot simply start a device that would speak to another device. Chances are the two devices are sleeping when they're doing nothing, so the communication will not work. How do you wake up a device? Well, you need to press a button somewhere, but this device must be somehow ready to receive messages. That's what is called the function of a server. So a server is a device that is waiting for messages to arrive and to do some job as opposed to a client that doesn't have to wait, which uh, does it on demand. When a client has something to send, it sends it to the server and the server is ready listening to, to things. So that's the definition of client and server. So that's the, I would say, the visible and useful part of computer communication. We have a PMU and a PDC, the PDC, phaser, phaser data concentrating unit that has the goal of putting together all the PMU measurements and uh, aligning them and from that to do what is called state in estimation that you will discuss in more details uh, in the following modules the so that's the useful part of the, of the communication system but for this to work we need to interconnect all those devices clients and servers through an infrastructure which is the network itself so it has cables ethernet cables or usb cables for things like pmu sometimes wireless links for things like your smartphone or your PC that's connected over Wi-Fi, uh, base stations, and all those things are interconnected by routers and something that is a bit underground, but is needed in a smart grid context, will need to be uh, interconnected. Uh, for example, PMUs are typically connected via uh, Ethernet cables to Ethernet switches that are connected to routers that are connected to other devices like the PDC. What we will discuss is what is the organization of this, in so far as it affects end users. End users is an engineer who's writing program from, for example, a PMU that is writing the program that has to send the data. So the way these things are organized influences uh, the way we write such programs and we interact with the networks. That's what we will discuss today. So here is the traditional description of how the internet technology is organized. It is called layers. So we see here, for example, all the software and hardware that runs on a smartphone. It is organized in a number of layers. The number of layers is not always agreed upon to be the same, but typically most textbooks will consider there are five layers, application, transport, network, Mac, and physical. We will discuss each of them in, in as much detail as we need to be able to have a good mental model. What is the definition of a layer? Well, a layer is nothing else than the classical problem we have in any complex system, which is modularity. We need to make a system made of pieces called modules that have well-defined interfaces such that I can interact with the module by knowing only the interface. This is what we do when we interact with our PC or our smartphone. We don't need to know all the details of how the operating system works to be able to send an email, for example. But we need to know what is the concept of a file, a directory, a permission. Those are things that affect us. So we need to know something which are essentially visible at the interface. That's the first principle that is common to all complex systems, and in particular in software systems. Here in, we have communicating systems. So communicating system means they have two types of interfaces. They have on this diagram the horizontal interface, which is when uh, module, for example, the application layer. The application layer is your web browser and the web server. There are two faces of the application layer. When a web browser speaks to a web server, it uses an interface, which is a software interface, which is defined by the HTTP protocol. The HTTP protocol, Hyper Transfer Text Protocol, uh, is the protocol that defines the internet. So it says 
what is the format of the messages you send, and uh, all the interactions, for example, when you go to a web server, you expect to send a, a verb called get followed by the name of the, of the page you want to download. And, uh, and that is the interface. So by nature, because we are communicating, layers communicate with other layers that are at the same, uh, of the same nature. So an application layer entity speaks to another application layer entity. In addition, an application layer entity speaks to the transport layer, which provides a service to it. We will discuss about that in a second. The transport layer is what we do when we implement the software. So we need to send data. How do I send data in a computer? Well, I use the interface of the transport layer, which in most systems is called the socket interface. That's the one you will uh, exercise in the lab. And similarly, the transport layer speaks to the network layer to have the data sent, and the network layer speaks to other uh, network layer entities. Here you see a difference is that the application and transport layer are end-to-end. -end. We expect them to be present only in client and servers, whereas the layers below, they build really what is called the interconnection infrastructure. They, they are more intermediate systems. For example, if I send a piece of information from here to a remote server, I will not have a direct network layer connection or a direct physical layer connection. I will go by a number of intermediate systems that are called routers or switches. So this is what we will discover in detail. So the first thing to remember is that the names of those four layers, physical, Mac, network, transport application, and this organization of layers. In the rest of today and next week, we will discuss all the details, what we need to know about all of these applications. The words TCP IP have to do with the names of the network layer. It's called IP. That's a synonym. And the transport layer has two modules, two variants, TCP and UDP. And the most spectacular one, because UDP is simplistic, is TCP. So that's the name of the protocol that is used here. I'm using the word protocol. What does a protocol mean? Well, a protocol in this context is exactly the specification of the format and, and of the rules at this interface, interface between two layers, two entities that are sitting in the, at the same layer. For example, HTTP is a protocol. It says exactly what is the format of the messages that a web client sends to a web server and what is the expected actions that result from sending such a format. What is the format of the error code, the 404 error that you receive? All of this is part of the HTTP protocol. Similarly, when a transport layer entity speaks to another transport layer entity, it uses a protocol, which is, for example, TCP. And IP is also the rules of how to a router and a host speak to each, uh, each other. That's called the Internet protocol and Ethernet, etc. We'll cover all of those in detail. Quasi all networks today use this. I say quasi, that means there are some who don't. Uh, 20 years ago, there were many who did not use. For example, if you have a Macintosh, 20 years ago, a Macintosh was not using TCP IP. It was using Apple Talk, which was not at all TCP IP. It was doing the same thing, but differently. So it was not using, it had a transport layer, an application layer, a network layer. The network layer was uh, using Apple Talk uh, things, which is Macintosh type of things, much easier to use, no name, no easy, no complicated address like we would discuss today, but it was not scalable. Uh, Apple Talk was made to connect perhaps uh, your 20 computers at home with 10 or in an office with a few printers and a few backend servers, but it did not scale to the global internet like IP does today. So this has disappeared. And there were zillions of things like Apple Talk, uh, DeckNet, IBM, they all had their own way of things. Those things have disappeared. But in the smart grid technology, there are in corners a few of them that remain. In particular, uh, there are sometimes protocols that don't use IP in substation automation. We will not discuss them in detail uh, because they tend to disappear because they don't add value to doing it in TCP IP. They are just here by uh, the result of evolution. So the application layer is fairly easy to imagine what it's doing. That's the software that runs in your web browser and in the web server. That's the application layer. Also, when a PDU sends data to a PDC, that's the smart grid application layer that does it. 
Now, the application layer uses the transport layer. So that's the first mysterious thing. What is the transport layer? Well, the transport layer is providing a programming interface to the application layer. Remember that the layering principle means that any layer, except the ones at the top, offers a service to the layer above it. So the goal is to simplify the job of the application layer. When you send packets, when you send data from one computer to another computer, you need to solve zillions of, 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 uh, of issues like, I mean, at the end, in order to send data, you don't send a page or an object or an image, you send bits. So how do you write the bits, in which order, uh, all of details need to be solved. And if you don't have a common layer to do that, everybody will solve it in their own way and it will be chaos. So in order to avoid this chaos and also to simplify the programming job of the application layer, there is a transport layer. So the transport layer says that if I need to send data from A to B, I will, uh, it, it will say exactly which software I can use and how, what are the, the usual terminology to do it. The transport layer exists in two variants. So that's the beginning of the complexity, UDP and TCP. I'm sure those are words you've already heard. UDP is the simplest of all. It does nothing else than simply solve software problem of how to put the bits in which order. Is it the first bit first? So if I have a byte of eight bit, do I write it first or last? Uh, that very simple set of things is the only things that UDP does. Plus, UDP adds the concept of a port number. So a port number is something that allows for two machines to communicate when they have more than one job in parallel. For example, imagine a PDC. PDC is talking to a number of PMUs, so it receives data from many PMUs. And also, a PMU similarly sends data to a PDC. But a PMU may do other things. You don't expect to log into a PMU to navigate the web. It would be a very bad idea for security purposes and from performance viewpoint. But certainly there are other things you do on a PMU. Can you imagine one of, one, one of them? Well, one of them that, yes. Time estimation, exactly. So there's a time protocol that will, there is another process that probably runs over UDP to receive the time correctly. So that's an example of a maintenance job. That's something in the, that's underground that we don't really care very much about the semantic of application, but we need it for the PMU tour. And also once in a while, and perhaps every week even, you will need to patch the software of your PMU because the PMU will probably use cryptographic software. This cryptographic software needs to be patched because uh, there's an arms race between the attackers and the defenders, and whenever we find a weakness in software, we fix it, and then we need to deploy the patch in the PMUs. Plus, you're working in the lab on your PMU, so chances are you always improve your signal processing software, so you want to modify it. How do you modify the software? Well, you need to transfer your uh, software code, a uh, large number of bits, into the PMU. You don't do that over the same, in, over the same application as you do the normal PMU job. So there is an and also, perhaps you want to log into the PMU to see if everything is okay. You, you will do an SSH uh, session into the PMU. So you will do a number of things in a PMU just for maintenance purposes. So there are a number of tasks, or in computer science, they're more often called processes, that work in parallel. Now, when you send a packet to a PMU, you need to say, is this a packet that the PDC is sending as an acknowledgement that the phase of measurement unit measurement has well been, has been received okay? Or is it a packet that instructs the PMU to report something like, uh, is the PMU up and working? That's what you do when you log into the PMU to verify its status or to configure. It. So that will go to different processes. So if you want to uh, identify to, and each of those processes is in an application layer of its own. So in order to know to which application layer the packet will be going, or within the application layer to which sub-function it is going, we use what is called a port number. So a port number is a 32-bit number that is associated with any activity that you do. So when you use the transport layer, you will do things like you say, I want to send data. I am the uh, phase of measurement unit application. Uh, give me a port number. 
we don't care which one it is here, and then send it to the port number of the PDC. I need to know the port number of the PDC. So typically, the port numbers of servers must be known in advance. That's the principle of client-server uh, communication. Remember, the server is expected to be up and running and waiting for things to come. So we, it cannot. The simple way to do it is also for the server to follow a well-known port number. So the PMU must be programmed with the port number of the of the PDC, and then the data when they are received by the IP layer will be forwarded to the UDP layer to with the information on the port number and the port number will be used to send the data to the correct process in the application layer. Why do I spend so much time discussing a minuscule detail of the application layer of the transport layer, which we will rediscuss in detail uh, a bit uh, next week is because for reasons that will be completely obvious next week this is visible everywhere so the trans the, the port number will be visible even if you're not programming the application layer it will be visible in a number of instances at, as will become clear uh, a bit later so first take home message here the transport layer uses port numbers to differ differentiate the processes inside the machine that need this so that's all for the global overview now we will dive into uh, the network and MAC layer, which are uh, those things here. The network and MAC layer are the interconnection network. Those are the things that allow to build a network. So first, the network layer. The network layer interconnects all systems in a given universe. So what is a universe? Well, for most of us, except perhaps in the smart grid, for most uses, it is the internet. So the internet is meant to be a globally interconnected system. So I can send a packet to a server in California or in China or anywhere, perhaps not North Korea, but most countries are part of this global universe. Uh, sometimes we have a special universe, for example, in the smart grid network, you may want to separate your production network. So typically industrial networks tend to be separated from the internet. So the network, the smart grid network, you want as much as possible to separate it. So that universe in that case is the smart grid network. Similarly, a train management or a railway station management network, you hope it is separated from the main internet so that you can't hack it essentially. So within these universes, the protocol which is called IP, stands for internet protocol, follows a number of principles that we will discuss in detail. So the first principle, which is a design uh, uh, which illustrates the main design. First, every interface has a number called IP address. So what is an interface? Well, this PC uh, is connected over Wi-Fi now, so the Wi-Fi interface has one IP address. I could also put an Ethernet cable into the PC. That would be a second interface that would have a second IP address. So every communication interface, uh, which are things by which you communicate, wireless adapters or cable system, has, an has a number like a telephone number, essentially. But it's called the IP address. Sometimes when you read uh, blogs on the internet, people call it IP, what's your IP? It's like if I ask you, what's your telephone? It means what's your telephone number? Here's the same, when people say IP, they mean IP address. And it must be unique in a given universe, of course. So all IP addresses in the world, in the global internet, has to have to be unique. Then the data received from the transport layer, remember the layering principle, the transport layer allows the programmer of the, of the application layer to, to send data through an interface. Then the transport layer has blocks of data. Then these blocks of data must be broken into things, chunks that are called packets. So that's the main principle of the internet, this uh, principle of packet switching, but the data uh, as soon as it leaves a machine is in the form of packets, which are relatively large by the technology of 20 years ago and relatively small by today's technology. Today, the maximum size of a packet is in principle 1500 bytes, so 12,000 bits. A byte is 8 bits. That's in principle the maximum size. I say in principle, it depends on the configuration of the systems. It's not always that number. But as a first approximation, that's that number here. So if you have to send a video file, 
then you will need to break it into thousands or hundreds of thousands of such packets. And each of those packets will navigate over the internet. Every, in order to navigate, every packet contains a destination address and also the source address. The source address is used essentially at the destination to know whom to respond to. If I connect to a web server, this web server will know where to send the reply by looking at the source address that's contained in the, in the packet. That's the principle of the postcard. So this is imitated from the postcard system of the post office. Except with the postcard, usually if we have a big message to send or a textbook to send, we don't write 20 postcards, which every postcard containing a page of the textbook, but that's how the internet works. And the systems that you expect to handle this are called routers. So you, you don't expect that my web client is connected to my web server. You expect that the web client is able to send a packet via Ethernet or Wi-Fi to a router that will send it to another router, etc. That will is essentially send it to the destination. So we expect that there are so-called switching systems called routers that receive packets that are intermediate systems. They are not the source nor the destination. Their job is to uh, allow the network to to operate here. That was invented in 1973. So you see. That's uh, 50 years ago. So here's an example where I'm sending a mail to someone. And you see that the mail is perhaps uh, containing a big uh, image that is broken into packets. So here I'm showing client and server at the periphery. And the boxes in the middle are routers. And if I'm sending a mail, I'm sending them to my mail server. The mail server will eventually send it to another mail server who is the mail server of the destination of the recipient and the mail server will send it to the pc or to the smartphone of whoever is sending it so here we see that we have four end systems that are uh, that are involved the web client the sorry the mail client that sends it to the mail server the mail server sends it to another mail server and the mail server sends it to the mail client that is very typical use of things. Normally in the internet, since we forward data at the IP layer, we have what is called the end-to-end -end principle. We want clients and servers to send the information directly from one to the other, not via going via zillions of intermediate servers, for example. But here it's not typically not possible because my mail software is not always up and running. My smartphone here in my pocket is sleeping. If you send me a mail now, uh, my smartphone is not able to receive. So to solve this problem, you send your smart, you send your mail not directly to me, but you send it to your mail server, your mail server, who is expected to be always up and running 24 hours a day, every day in the year, will send it to my mail server, which probably are both the same server, which is EPFL uh, server. And then whenever my smartphone decides that I want to get the, the mail, I will connect to it. So that's the uh, typical thing. Did you observe anything special on this animation? They did not follow the same route. So that's the principle of this postcard system. If I send every packet is a standalone entity that can follow possibly different paths on the internet. It can happen, as we will see, it's not forbidden, but it will impact performance, for example, when we do we large we send large amounts of data with tcp as we will discuss that impacts performance but that is possible in the internet today most routers will train to avoid will try to avoid this but it is uh, possible in particular the idea is that this inter uh, interconnection layer is largely independent of the of the thing here for example if one router goes down so you have to imagine the internet is huge systems there are millions of uh, devices so what's the probability that in a given interaction, if you're logged into something and, and your session lasts an hour, was the probability that at least one of the devices on the path has a problem and boots or is the software is uh, patched or something happens that causes an interruption of service? The probability is large. So this design, this uh, has been designed to allow for this. That's why the packets here can be independent entities if one of the routers goes down and another path is found, the packet will find its way to go to another path here. So we cannot guarantee that the path will always be the same. That's a consequence of 
allowing the system to reconfigure smoothly and completely independently, which is the success of the internet. That's why the internet was a success compared to other technologies, is that it has the ability to repair uh, errors easily and reconfigure. A few words about the addresses. So I said IP addresses are like telephone numbers, but they have a very different uh, syntax. So there are two addressing formats, IPv4 and IPv6, which we will discuss both in detail. And here, that's really something we're exposed to. So we have to understand them. So the IPv4 address is the old, is the last, ver the last but one version. The current version is IPv6, but the most widespread version is still the old one. So it, it is 32 bit long. So every IP address is 32 bits. And it is written in what is called dotted decimal notation. Dotted decimal means that we write a block of 32 bits as four bytes, four blocks of eight bits. And every byte is written by using its decimal representation. So if, for example, if I have this sequence of eight bits, which is here, one zero one one zero zero one zero, we interpret this as the expansion in base two of a number. So this is zero plus one times two plus zero times two to the power of two plus zero times two to the power of three, etc. It's a bit painful, but that's so it's uh, we interpret that as a number, and if we expand it. 2 plus 16, which is here, 1, uh, one times uh, 2 to the power of 4, plus 1 times 2 to the power of 5, plus 1 times 2 to the power of 7, that gives 178. So what, instead of writing this list of 8 bits, we write 178, which is, for example, uh, this block here. IP, uh, IP addresses at EPFL, most of them start with 128, a few of them with 129. But 128, 178, 151.1, that means this is this sequence of bits here. This is all totally obsolete. This is because it was done in the 70s. Today, we would use hexadecimal digits. An hexadecimal digit is based on the observation that if we use, well, the observation first is we don't want to use base two, which is a natural thing that computers use. But we don't want to use it because it's very long and sequences of zeros and ones are uh, quasi impossible to read and, and write, right? If you say that's my IP address, chances are you will not be happy writing this down and it would be a lot of errors. So base 16 hexadecimal digit is based on the observation that if we take as base not 10, like we do because we have 10 fingers, but 16 because that's close to 10 and is a power of two, that means that a block of four bits here is represented by one hexadecimal digit. So for example, one zero, so hexadecimal digits means we count from zero to 10 by using the first the nine digit uh, from zero to 15, sorry, was zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then 10 is letter A, 11 is letter B, etc. until F, which is 15. So we use 16 symbols. If we had 16 fingers instead of 10, this is how we would count. But nature has uh, given us 10 fingers, uh, so it's inconsistent with binary computers here. But all computer science uses always hexadecimal digits to write bits. Because, for example, if I have eight bits to write, that corresponds to two hexadecimal digits. So if IPv4 were invented today, we would not use this notation for the address 128.178.151.1, we would use this one 80B29701, which is equally ugly but is much shorter. And we don't need the dot because the dots are needed here. Because if I don't have the dot, what would happen? Well, I would not know, for example, if I have 151.1, I would not know whether it's 15.11 or 151.1. So I need the dots to be able to eliminate the leading zeros. If I have the discipline to always put 001 instead of 151, then that would not be needed. Also, as you can see, it is less uh, compressed. I need three digits 
uh, whereas with exosimal, I need only two characters here. So this is the, I would say, the state of the art here. This is how IPv4 does it for us, and uh, we'll have to live with both. So an, an IP address is something like this. There are special IP addresses that we must know. The special IP addresses are, in particular, the so-called private addresses. Private addresses are, those ones are called public addresses. So a public address is like a telephone number. I mean, you don't choose your telephone number. It's given to you by your operator. It's the same for IP addresses. Your IP address, you don't choose it. It's given by your operator which is today the same as a telephone uh, operator. So if at home you are a customer of Swisscom for your ADSL uh, access, which Swisscom gives you an IP address. You don't choose it. Perhaps if you pay a lot, you can ask Swisscom to give you a specific address that ends with your birthday or something like this. But still, it will be within the block and the prefix that Swisscom is allowed to use. All EPFL address starts with 128. Uh, 178 or 128 179 here so the only thing you can negotiate with the pfl uh, would be the the, the leading uh, terms here so an, an epfl an ip address is allocated at the top by an, an entity called ICANN that gives blocks of address to the different parts of the world and then in Europe, for example, there is an entity called RIPE that allocates to different operators that run in countries uh, a block of addresses. So Swisscom has received a block of addresses and uh, allocates to you one of these addresses. EPFL also has received a block of addresses, which is uh, this one. here. Private addresses, in contrast, belong to nobody. Everybody is allowed to use them. But the meaning is you use them in your private network. For example, if you build a smart grid that has 2,000 PMUs and 20 PDCs, you can give them private addresses as long as it's your private universe. It's not connected to the rest of the world. That's very convenient for debugging for a number of reasons and also to make private networks that are truly not connected for, to the global internet here. There are three blocks of addresses, 10 dot something, 192, 168, and 172. Uh, dot 16 to dot 31 so anything that's in these blocks and you can use any of those three blocks freely as you want uh, typically your if you look at your uh, ip address when you're at home you will probably have an address of this type this is for fairly small network and that's the software that swisscom has probably pre-programmed into your, your adsl router and at epfl in a small grid for example we will use uh, those addresses typically there's also a special address, which is this one, 127.0.0.1, which is uh, called local host. It means this machine. So if I send, if a process A sends a packet to a process B to this address, that means A and B are on the same machine. You can say, well, what's the point? The uh, point of communicating is when you're not on the same machine. Well, first, not always. You can have what is called inter-process communication. You can have two applications that communicate with each other. Whether they are on the same machine or not, they may want to use the same software. For example, you can have a web client that is sitting on the same machine as your web server that you will do, for example, when you are in the debugging phase. When you're debugging your system, you may want to put both on the same machine and try it by uh, giving IP address and uh, you will be able to use this IP address. So those are addresses we will very often use. So that was for, yes, question. How do you, con so you, the best is to have a calculator. So all calculators do that today. So anything called a scientific calculator will have a mode called decimal, binary, hexadecimal. If you type a number, and you hit hexadecimal, and if you, the mode was decimal, you type it as decimal. If you type hexadecimal, it will convert it to you. But if you're interested in how do we convert, well, here is the rule. The rule is that you expand that according to the powers of two. And six base hexadecimal is according to the power of 16. So B2 means two plus B times 16. Just like 151 means 1 
plus 5 times 10 plus 1 times 10 to the power 2. That's what base 10 means. Base 16 means the same. This is 2 plus b. b means 11. So that's 2 plus 11 times 16. That should give exactly uh, 178 in decimal notation. It's painful in principle. You use a calculator for that. But there are some special things we might want to know. For example, all ones everywhere. If you add one to this, that gives, it's like 999999 in decimal, decimal. If you add one to 99, you obtain 100. So that's the last number before the one that would be one followed by eight zero. So that's 256. That's two to the power eight minus one. So that's 255. In hexadecimal, a block, now the mapping hexadecimal to binary is easier in the sense that you do it by entire blocks of four bits. A block of four bits correspond to exactly one hexadecimal digit, which is not true for binary. Binary, it's the, where the digits start is completely unrelated to the separation. And 11111 is the number F. It's 15. It's the largest hexadecimal single digit number. So FF is the same as all bits equal to 1 and is the same as 255. That's something we need to remember because we will see it in the configuration of machines, for example. That was the first principle of IP. So the first principle was we use packet switching. We Every packet has a source and destination address, and the addresses are 32-bit long uh, systems with IPv4, at least. Second principle is called longest prefix match. And that's really what made the internet scalable. Longest prefix match means that every system, in particular, every router, has a table and to know what to do with packets. So remember, the principle is when a computer when sends a packet to another computer, like here, for example, it doesn't send it directly over a long cable, but it sends it to a router that sends it to another router, etc. So the routers, the intermediate systems, have what is called a routing table. It turns out that the hosts, the, the client and servers, also have a routing table. One of the principles of IP is that, like in Unix in general, that you don't really make a difference between end system and intermediate system unless there's a strong need for making that difference. So hosts and routers have a routing table. Let's zoom on the routing table of this box here. This box is a router that is sitting at the interface of EPFL, that's the EPFL network, and the switch network. Switch is like Swisscom, it's uh, an operator. That is a special one that's funded by the Swiss government primarily to interconnect uh, research institutions and universities and schools. So this router called ED0-SWY, so which means epine dorsal zero, backbone zero, and switch. So that's the reflection that it's just sitting in front of the switch network and in front of the backbone of EPFL. If we look at its routing table, here I'm giving a simplified view of it. It contains three lines. So a routing table contains columns, which have, correspond to fields. There may be many details that we won't discuss here, but the main details are the destination, the next hop, and the interface. So there are, in fact, three columns here. They are put together here. What does it mean? It means for every packet where the destination address corresponds to this, here is what to do with the packet. And what to do with the packet means two things where to send it so there's an interface number here to make the story simpler i put south but in computers it's they are not called south they are called with names such as e0 or eth1 or uh, un1 so they have letters that correspond to uh, eth0 to stand for ethernet zero so that's the, the name of the physical interface here so here it means any packet that has an IP destination address that matches this string here should go to the south interface. South interface is here and should be going to whom? To this IP address. This IP address is this one here. So that's, it means if this guy has a packet with a destination address that matches this, 
it should send it over the self interface and it should send it to the IP, to the router that has this IP address. Here, we don't know whether it's the router or the final destination, but it just says to the system that has this IP address. Now, a few words about this, the destination. The destination is not one IP address, but is a prefix. Prefix means it's not the full address, but it's anything that starts with the first 24 bits of this address. So the slash 24 means consider only the first 24 bits of this. Here, this is a string of three dotted decimal integers. A dotted decimal integer represents eight bits. So that's a string of exactly 24 bits. So we could say the slash 24 is useless because that's exactly 24. But because of the hexadecimal, the dotted decimal notation, if you want to express only the first 25 bits, for example, you will not be able to write a number of, of decimal digits that corresponds to exactly five, 25 bits. So we put the slash 24 to be explicit here. Here there are three, uh, two other entries, 128, 178, slash 16, and another entry, which is 0, slash 0. So an IP address or an IP prefix 0 is means invalid. So it's not a valid address. The IP address 0 is not a valid address. But the slash 0 means it's empty. So that means that's the empty prefix. Because we use prefix matching, also called longest prefix match. So what does it mean? Well, it means assume here, consists sends a packet to lemma, LRC MAC4. So it will send an IP packet to this address, 128, 178, 129.64. It will create an IP packet. The IP destination address will be this one. When this packet reaches this router, this router will go to the table here and will try to match all those lines here. The first one, does it match? The answer is yes. Does it match? It means whether the 24 bits of this prefix here are found exactly as the first 24 bits of this address. The answer is yes. So it matches this here. Does it match this one? Are the first 16 bits of the address equal to 128, 178? The answer is also yes. It also matches the second line. Does it match the third line? Well, also yes, because the third line is empty. So anything matches this one. You always match because that's you have nothing to check. So it matches the three lines. And the IP principle number two says, if you have multiple matches, you take the more specific one, the longest which means this packet will follow the rules dictated by the first line, which means it will go to this router via the self interface. So it will be sent here. It will go here, which is the correct thing to do. Now assume ComSys sends a packet to DISUN3. The address is 128.178.79.9. Well, the difference is that the first line does not match. The lines two and three do match. So we will send it to the longest of the matching lines, which is the second one, which means it will go to 100.3, also via the south interface. So it will be sent over the south interface, but to this router here, which will be going there. Now assume LRC MAC4 replies to consist and sends a packet to this address, 129.132.66.46. That's an address at ETHZ in Surrey. And if, if the, when the packet reaches the box here, what does this router do? Well, it looks at all the matches. We see this does not match, this does not match. So the only thing that matches is this one. So it will send it to the north, to this interface here. So this is what this table encapsulates. What is it really doing? What is the semantic of doing this? Well, it means, this table means that by default, send everything to the north to switch. Then, second default, anything that starts with 128, 178, which in practice means the wired network of EPFL. So it means if it's EPFL, send it by default to this here, which is the backbone of EPFL. With one exception, for some reason, there is one part of the EPFL network that's not on the general backbone, but is directly connected here. So that's an exception here. So this is what longest prefix match allows you to do. It allows to have default rules, 
and then to supersede the default by more specific things that can be nested. And that's the key to make the internet scalable. In the internet, there's 1 million different IPv4 prefixes. When we take the sum of all the prefixes that are possible somewhere, networks in California, in India, everywhere in the world, the, 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 the sum of all those possible prefixes is 1 million. But we see with just three lines, this router is able to reach the entire internet. That is what makes uh, IP uh, work well and work the way it is. And that's why we have this rule here. Of course, this is only when an IP packet is received by a machine and this machine knows it has to forward it beyond uh, itself. If I send a packet to the address 128.178.100.12, uh, that means to the router itself, then the router will pass it to the transport layer, will not look at the routing table because it's one IP address of itself, which is a very rare case, but is what the network managers of EPFL do. Once in a while, they might go into this router to look at statistics or to change its configuration, for example. A consequence of this is that the IP addresses must be structured. If I am at EPFL, with my smartphone, I come in the morning uh, at home, then I move to EPFL, my IP address must change. My IP address when I am at home is not an EPFL address. It's a, I'm a customer of Sunrise, so I have a Sunrise address at home. Uh, at EPFL, I have an EPFL address. So the, that's a corollary that the IP addresses reflect the network in which you are, which roughly speaking reflects the geography. This is why if you go to French TV and try to stream some uh, program, they will refuse because they recognize your IP address is in Switzerland. They will, it's a block that has been allocated to Switzerland. So they know where you are by looking at the IP address. Not exactly. I mean, I can have an EPFL address. EPFL has multiple sites in Valis, in Fribourg, in Geneva, in Ecublan. You don't know which of the sites you're in if you don't know exactly the numbering plan of EPFL, which a priori is not something public. So uh, you just know it's EPFL, but you know it's not in France. You don't know exactly where it is, but coarsely you do. So the IP address must be depending on when you are, and that means it must be configured. When I come in the morning here, my smartphone needs to acquire an IP address of EPFL. Question? We'll talk about it uh, next week. That's a very good question. I could well be at home and using the VPN have an EPFL address, but let's postpone this question to, to next week. Before connecting to the VPN, I must first have an, a valid IP address, which will be the IP address given to me by Swisscom, Sunrise, or whoever my operator is. So it means my address must be configured. Uh, we can do it manually. You will see in the lab some IF config or things like this that allow you to give an IP address to an interface. You can do it manually very easily. Also, and if you uh, try to fiddle with the configuration of your smartphone, you will find a way uh, when you go in the settings of your smartphone, you can give an IP address that you want. But of course, this is not usually very useful because you should know exactly why you do this. And this is typically done automatically by a protocol called DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, which is started when you join, either when you, typically when you join a Wi-Fi network somewhere, the first thing that you will do is uh, acquire, the first thing that your software will do when it de uh, detects that there's a new interface that's, uh, or a new Wi-Fi network that is becoming valid, it will try to get automatically this address. And if it does, it will get, for example, an, EP, an address of 128.178 when it's at EPFL. At EPFL, when, if you connect via Ethernet, you have to do it manually. You have, if you connect to Ethernet, the, you have to ask your system manager to which IP address you, is allocated to you personally, to your machine, and you have to type in the configuration, uh, your addresses. So for hosts, that's either simply uh, done automatically when you connect to a network or manually, that's fairly simple. In routers, you need to configure not just the address of the router, but also the entire routing table. And this is done typically by things called BGP or OSPF. 
which we will not discuss in detail, but those are the protocols that run between all the routers of EPFL. So the EPFL system managers will not log into this router and type in the three entries that I gave. Those will be discovered automatically by having the routers speak to each other and discover what are the available things and how to uh, write a routing table that reflects that. Here are a few, uh, a few uh, commands that you can use in your own in your own uh, machine to to come to to look at that, and we'll do that in Lab One. You will uh, that's the kind of things you will be able to do in Lab One. So if we conclude this first hour, and plus plus ten, or oh, we could build a network by connecting all systems to routers, then connecting the routers to routers. But this is not the way it's usually done. So perhaps in 20 years, that's the way it will be done. And then this course with the first hour would stop here. But today, that's not the way it's done. If you connect systems together, you connect them either to a Wi-Fi station or to an Ethernet switch. And why do we have these? And how does it combine uh, with the rest? In particular, if I connect to an Ethernet switch, I don't need IP addresses. So those are systems that I don't need IP addresses. So I've just explained that the IP addresses are the mechanism by which we can build an entire network, but there is something else, something else below it. Why and how does it work? Well, that's a bit of a mystery, but we will do a break now. And after the break, we will discuss uh, the solution to this mystery. So let's dive now into the mysteries of the Mac layer. The Mac layer was created at about the same time as the IP layer, but with very different requirements. The goal is to interconnect a small number of systems. There is no need for a large number of systems. And second, it should be completely plug and play, no configuration, zero configuration. This differs from the IP layer. In the IP layer, there's a large number of configurations we need to do. We need to have a numbering plan in particular. Other than that, the principle is very similar. Every communication interface has a MAC address. MAC address is 48 bits, is written in hexadecimal digits, because at this time the MAC was meant to be visible only by engineers, unlike the IP address, which is visible by anybody who uses the system. So we used hexadecimal numbers. The MAC address is also called a physical address, because it's really the number that's engraved in the hardware. When you buy a PC that has an Ethernet interface, the Ethernet interface comes with a number put by the manufacturer at time when this was built. So we have every system has an address, which in principle should be unique uh, worldwide. Second, Mac layer forwards packets that come from the IP layer. They are called frames uh, at the Mac layer. And the packets, very much like the IP layer, contain a source MAC address and a destination MAC address. The source MAC address is put by the adapter at the source, and the destination address, like in IP, identifies whom the packet should be sent to. An Ethernet switch has a MAC forwarding table, very similar to the IP routing table of a router, but there is a big difference. The big difference is that that's an exhaustive list of all the MAC addresses of all the systems that are reachable in this environment by this MAC layer uh, system. Here I'm showing a small network with an Ethernet switch with three systems, A, B, C, and each of the three addresses are written in the table here. So when A sends a packet to C, the Ethernet switch looks up the table, looks at all the entries until it finds an exact match. Hopefully the match is present. Now you could ask me, how can that be plug and play if I buy an Ethernet switch? By the way, an Ethernet switch is often uh, called simply a multiport, an Ethernet multiport extender. Uh, you can buy for 30 francs at Migro. There's no way you can go into it. You cannot configure it. You cannot log into such a system. So how is this table written if we cannot configure it? Well, the answer is the switch learns it by observing the traffic. When A sends a packet to C, the packet contains a source MAC address 
which is the address of A, 0, 8, etc. When the Ethernet switch sees such a packet on interface number 1, it concludes that the system that is sitting on interface number 1 has this MAC address, so it writes in its table this address. Now, of course, when A sends a packet to B for the first time, there is nothing in the table that says where B is. In such a case, the Ethernet switch simply broadcasts the packet to all interfaces. It will simply send it to all interfaces except A, so to B and C. C will receive the packet, B will receive the packet. The hardware will analyze the destination address. The Ethernet hardware at B will see that's for me. The hardware at C will see it's not for me. And if C is not spying, is not trying to hack the network, then C, the hardware at C will simply di discard the packet. By doing that, B will receive the packet. And in most cases, if A sends a packet to B, sooner or later, B will also send a packet, probably to A, perhaps to some other device. So as soon as B sends a packet to A, perhaps by sending an acknowledgement to the data received from A, the switch will learn the MAC address of B and will put it in this table. The next time that A sends a packet to B, it will not be broadcasted, it will be going directly via the switch to B because now B has an entry in its table and it says it's on interface number two on port two. This table is learned and it is put in what is called a cache. So this forwarding table is a cache. A cache means that if the t it means this is data that we have learned on the fly and we associate a timer with it is after some time, which is a few minutes, for example, there is no traffic from A then the forwarding table will flush the entry A and will need to, if B after that flushing sends a packet to A, then the broadcast will happen again. Why do we do this? Well, it could be, for example, that you change your mind, you disconnect A that was connected on interface one and you connect another system. So that will allow the Ethernet switch to learn this new address after a few minutes of uh, uh, time needed for the cache entry to be flushed. So altogether, this means that the switch is completely plug and play, but there's a price to pay for this, is that it does not scale. We can do this with a switch that has a few hundreds, perhaps a few thousands of ports, but certainly not millions or hundreds of millions of ports, because the tables would be huge, and the time it takes to do an exact match in a huge table would also be prohibitive. So there is no scalability. Also, with longest prefix match, we could have a network structure that would allow to aggregate by default routes, for example. Here, this is impossible. The MAC addresses have no structure. They, in fact, reflect only the who manufactured the interface, but not where your system is. If I move from EPFL to home, I keep the same MAC address, and this is no problem for the switch I have at home and for the switch at EPFL that's carrying my traffic. Wi-Fi is very similar, with one additional thing. Wi-Fi has, in addition to handle collisions, this is similar to other MAC layers, such as power line communication, that's very much used in electrical uh, systems. Bluetooth is also very similar. Like Ethernet, they all use MAC addresses only to decide where to send the packet. But in addition, they need to handle collisions. What is a collision? Where if I'm on a wireless system where A sends a packet to B, if at the same time C sends a packet to B also, to the base station, then there will be uh, an interference. Now, if you're lucky, if the power received from C is much smaller than the power received from A, then the interference can be treated as noise and the signal sent from A can be decoded. But if you're unlucky, if the power of C is about as the same as the power from A, or even worse, much larger, then the interference will make it impossible for B to decode the signal received from A. So there will be a collision, and in worst case, it can be that A and C are both sending to B, and none of those packets are received by the base stations, which means we have a total loss of packets here. So the MAC layer in such settings has to handle also collisions. This is why it is called MAC, Medium Access Control. It has to do with serializing the access to 
prevent collisions as much as possible and to handle collisions that cannot be avoided. There are many ways this can be done. In Wi-Fi, this can be done using one mechanism called RTS-CTS, where when a, pack, a system such as A wants to send data to the base station, to B, it will first send a very short message called the RTS, the ready to send. This very short message is sent in a way such that it is possible to decode it even if there are collisions, or at least it's easier to decode it even if there are collisions. Why is that possible? Well, imagine that you have to send a single bit, which is a zero or a one, and there's a lot of noise or, or interference around. Well, one way to send it is, for example, to send a continuous signal that is coded on one frequency, if it's one, and on another frequency, if it is zero, and you send it for one million bits uh, repeated equal to one. If B receives such a signal by analyzing the energy that's present in the two frequency bands, it can conclude if there's more energy in the one band than in the zero band, that the one was sent. That's an example of how we can still decode and receive a signal, uh, a bit of information, even if there is a large noise or interference. So using similar systems, the RTS is sent in a way that is very immune to collisions. And the RTS is saying, I would like to send a frame of a given duration, and if the RTS is properly received, it is acknowledged by B, who sends a clear to send. And this clear to send, it will be received by practically all systems. It will be received by A, who is the intended recipient, but also by C. This clear to send contains the destination MAC address of A. So when A sees it and decodes it, it sees, oh, that's for me. And now A knows it has the token. It has the right to transmit, so it will transmit the data. And when C receives this clear to send, it says it's not for me. The clear to send will contain an indication of how much time the transmission is expected to last, which depends on the bit rate that's uh, available between A and B. And C will defer for a time that is at least as large as this time here. So that means that if this RTS-CTS handshake works, A is guaranteed to have the channel for the duration of time that was that is necessary for sending the packet. The packet is so shown in pink. It consists of one or several blocks of data that consists of one single MAC frame. And it is also completed by an acknowledgement sent from B to A that serves to confirm that everything was okay, in particular that there was no uh, other collisions uh, during this time, so everything worked as intended. And this is what is used to guarantee uh, somehow that the collision will be avoided. Of course, when B has received a packet from A, presumably the packet is not for B, but is perhaps for another system such as C. So a similar system will occur between B and C. There will be also be a clear to send uh, ready to send, uh, clear to send, and that will guarantee that collisions can be avoided. Now we've seen Mac layer on the left for Wi-Fi. We've seen Mac layer on the right for uh, Ethernet. We can build small networks, a yellow and a red one. In order to interconnect them, we can typically use an IP router. In fact, this is the classical use of IP routers, and this is how IP has emerged and became successful as a solution for interconnecting local area networks. How does it work? Well, first we put a router that has both a, a Wi-Fi interface and an Ethernet interface, and every and we give it an IP address uh, for each of these interfaces, a different IP address for each of these interfaces, and we must inform all the machines, all the IP machines that are in the yellow or in the red subnetwork we must inform them of this IP and MAC address of this default router. In fact, as we see, we inform them at the IP layer with the IP address and uh, they will discover the MAC addresses automatically. So when A has a packet to send to P, A is on Wi-Fi, P is on Ethernet, it will create an IP packet with destination address, the IP address of the printer, and you will send it to the router. Sending it to the router means it will create a MAC packet, a MAC layer frame, that will have as MAC destination address, the MAC address of the router. 
So the packet will be received by the router. The router will look at the IP destination address and will send it over Ethernet to the Ethernet MAC address of P by using its Ethernet interface. For this, of course, we need that A knows the IP address, knows the presence of the router, which is a configuration that's needed. Now, assume B has the packet to send to P, then the communication will be done by sending uh, the packet directly to P to the IP address of P. So communication with TCP IP always uses IP addresses even if it's inside a local area network, even if B sends to P, they're both on Ethernet, you could send a packet from B to P without using IP addresses, but with TCP IP, we mandate that we always use IP addresses.